Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. No disclosures pertinent to uh, this presentation. I wanted to cover diagnostic uh, colonoscopy in some fairly simple aspects here in terms of uh, indications, uh, preparation, and uh, techniques. In terms of indications, there are actually multiple guidelines out there, um, but basically they can be broken down into three groups. Indications for screening and prevention of colorectal cancer, surveillance of polyps and prior history of cancer, and investigation of symptoms. I'm not going to go into this in great detail. I'm going to focus primarily on the practical aspects of this because there's actually, uh, looking out there in the literature and even in vi uh, various atlases, video atlases, there's actually very little out there on the basics of diagnostic colonoscopy. So the uh, indications are, are available out there. In terms of preparation, three things have to be prepared. The endoscopist, and there are also guidelines out there in terms of the training and number of cases that one is expected to have in order to do these independently. One has to be able to prepare the equipment pr appropriately and the patient and their colon. Um, I think this may not be the uh, correct version of the presentation because there was supposed to be an extra clip in there. Uh, anyway, we can come back to that. In ter terms of techniques, um, techniques of insertion, and then I break it down into different parts of the colon. Uh, each portion of the colon has little tips and tricks in terms of being able to uh, maneuver around it, and I've broken it down into each of these parts. So first of all, in terms of inserting the scope, very basic steps. Uh, first of all, inspect the perianal area. Many people miss perianal lesions, uh, changes in the skin, uh, condyloma, an early anal cancer, Digital exam is important. A traumatic insertion. Some people insert the scope sideways. Some people insert it um, with the tip. It's important with either to be gentle. Um, and then establish the three rectal valves. On inserting the scope, um, when there's very little air in there, it's difficult to actually see the three valves. And there's a lot of maneuvering with the tip of the scope. I actually find it easier to insufflate the rectum uh, fairly well before attempting to get round the valves. Uh, that makes insertion easier, and then you start with a straighter scope before entering the, the sigmoid colon. In the sigmoid colon, it's important to avoid um, over-insertion, and by that I mean pushing the scope in too far without keeping the, the sigmoid colon telescoped uh, onto the shaft of the scope. Um, by over-inserting and establishing too much of a loop, this almost sets one up for failure later on in, in the colonoscopy. Uh, by having too much redundancy and paradoxical movement. Uh, so therefore, it's important to keep the sigmoid colon short and collapse down onto the scope, many times by uh, short in and out movements of, of the colonoscope as it's being advanced. Uh, I find it helpful if any twisting motion of the shaft is required is to keep it in a clockwise direction. Theoretically, this keeps the sigmoid colon therefore rotated clockwise uh, and theoretically, along the left side of the patient's abdominal wall, again, helping to buttress the scope as it's advanced proximally. Um, as I mentioned, you want to keep the, the, the colon telescoped onto the shaft, or some people refer to it as accordioning of the bowel on the shaft of the scope, and avoiding the formation of a sigmoid loop. Typical appearance of the sigmoid colon, this is where you encounter the first uh, diverticular. Um, as you can see here at the 12 o'clock position, it's important to uh, stay with the lumen of the bowel and not try intubating the diverticula themselves, which can be difficult in a patient with uh, multiple diverticula and uh, a lot of uh, uh, spastic uh, colon, where it's difficult to differentiate between the lumen uh, and the ostium of a diverticulum. Um, here you see a, a diverticulum with an interspersated stool ball, these little balls. You find them actually in the lumen uh, in the rest of the prep, almost pathognomonic for diverticulosis. So here we are uh, getting into the sigmoid uh, colon from the rectum, uh, typically uh, quite a little bit of angulation, uh, getting around the rectosigmoid colon and avoiding uh, diverticular at that point. A little bit of slide by I think is acceptable as long as the patient is uh, comfortable. Uh, I don't like excessive use of uh, slide by techniques again uh, because that can introduce the formation of a loop that's difficult to uh, uh, then uh, deal with later on during the colonoscopy. Uh, on entering the descending colon uh, from the sigmoid, there's usually a little sigh of relief at that point, having um, 
uh, having got through the sigmoid. Have you lost sound on this? Can we turn our sound back on, please? Can you hear me? Is that better now? Great. Um, entering the descending colon, oftentimes at this point you can see uh, a longer length of uh, the colon than you've been able to see up until that point through all the twists and turns of the uh, sigmoid. Uh, again, it's important prior to that to avoid formation of a sigmoid loop. If you have a loop at this point already, it may be possible to pull back. Oftentimes it's not possible to pull back until one gets to the splenic flexure. So therefore, in order to advance through the descending colon, occasionally it's necessary to involve abdominal pressure, but usually it's not required at this point. So typically here you see as you get into the uh, descending colon, you get that tunnel view. Okay, uh, you've got the tunnel view of the uh, descending colon there. That, as I said, you often uh, have a sigh of relief having uh, finished the, some of the maneuvers in, in the sigmoid colon to get to this point. So here we are coming out of the sigmoid uh, colon. And t typically, oftentimes in the sigmoid colon, there's a fair amount of spasm which can be relieved by irrigating with warm water. I find that uh, more effective than using glucagon. Typically using glucagon, by the time it kicks in, you finish the colonoscopy. And then here you kind of get that tunnel view of the uh, descending colon. At the uh, splenic flexure, sometimes it can be difficult to determine if, if one is there in a, a patient with a very tortuous sigmoid colon, sometimes just going from the sigmoid into the descending, one can think that one's already at the splenic flexure. But at the splenic flexure, you can typically see a transmitted cardiac apical pulse. Uh, sometimes at this point, in order to negotiate the splenic flexure, it may be necessary to place the patient in a, a supine position. And again, the use of abdominal pressure uh, uh, to assist in advancing the scope proximally, particularly again, if one already has a, a loop uh, in the scope. At this point though, having traversed the splenic flexure and now being in the distal uh, transverse colon, it's then possible to uh, effectively hook the tip of the colonoscope uh, at that point and pull back in order to uh, uh, take out uh, any uh, excess uh, uh, shaft of the colon that's uh, creating a, a sigmoid loop. In the transverse colon, this is typically recognized by noticing that the classic triangular folds. There are triangular folds in the descending colon, but typically the corners of those folds uh, do not approximate, uh, whereas in the, the transverse colon they do. Again, uh, in a patient with redundant transverse colon, which can dip well into the, the lower abdomen, it's important to avoid looping, and again, abdominal pressure can uh, help with that. So here you see that the classic triangular folds of the uh, transverse colon, and you notice that the, uh, the folds actually meet at the corners, which differentiates that from the, from the descending colon. So here we're getting uh, into the uh, transverse colon. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this with some of the, the, the lesser volume preps that we're moving to, but they seem to have more retained fluid. Feels a little bit like spelunking sometimes. And here we're getting around the transverse colon again. You kind of see the, uh, the transverse, uh, the classic transverse uh, uh, fold appearance where it's triangulated. At the hepatic flexure, sometimes surprisingly, this can actually be more angulated and uh, more difficult to get around than even the, the splenic flexure. One of the distinguishing features here is that one starts noticing a wider lumen uh, that does distinguish it from the, from the splenic flexure. Um, occasionally, where the folds overlap here, it may sometimes have the appearance uh, of the confluence of tenure, and people may think they're at the cecum when they're actually not. So I do teach, teach the uh, residents and, and fellows who work with me that if they only think they're at the cecum, they're not. They're at the hepatic cecum, which doesn't count. So here, coming along the uh, distal transverse colon, and uh, again, typically this may be, may be a little harder to get around. You kind of get a sense of the sharp angulation here and the amount of movement that the tip is having to make. Again, talking the clockwise, uh, talking the scope clockwise, and then oftentimes you just drop into the, uh, the cecum at this point if, the, if there's a relatively short ascending colon. At the cecum, um, it's important to recognize the landmarks, the confluence of the uh, tenia, one of my teachers used to refer to that as the Mercedes-Benz sign when you see that. Um, I have no disclosures related to that. Uh, 
Um, you ha it's important to find the appendiceal base and notice the ileocecal valve. As I mentioned before, if you only think you're at the cecum, you're probably not. You're probably still at the hepatic flexure. And again, just to move that final last part from the ascending colon actually into the cecum itself, abdominal pressure may be required. Uh, sometimes it's helpful if the patient has been supine to move uh, back uh, to the left lateral position. Uh, although even a, a supine position may, may uh, assist if it's a very difficult cecum to enter. Uh, other tricks for entering the cecum are aspirating air that can effectively shorten the colon and help move the uh, tip of the scope into the cecum. Uh, another little trick is having the patient take a deep breath, and sometimes that can also help assist getting the tip of the colonoscope into the cecum itself. So here you see um, the, uh, the ileocecal valve uh, off to the left. Typically, if I am doing a colonoscopy for screening or surveillance purposes, I do not intubate the ileocecal valve, uh, only if I'm uh, concerned about cases of uh, IBD. Uh, some individuals do routinely intubate the ileocecal valve, thinking that that then gives them the practice should they then need to intubate it on an IBD patient. But on typical screening patients, I find that unnecessarily adds time and doesn't add anything to the diagnostic yield. So here we have been in the cecum, and there you can actually see the cecum popping a few bubbles of air there to confirm that that is the ileocecal valve. Uh, again, other features of the ileocecal valve, besides seeing it uh, actively extruding small bowel contents into the cecum, uh, are the uh, thickness of that fold and typically a, a kind of paler yellowish color from, from the uh, greater fat content at that point. Uh, again, actually in the cecum itself, it's important to confirm that the base of the appendix has been seen. It's, it truly is important uh, to really get into the cecum and, and have a good look around. I find it's not uncommon uh, that I see patients um, from outside who've been referred with a, a cecal cancer and they've actually had a, a colonoscopy within the last year or two and then one has to assume that the lesion has possibly been missed by, um, so by a previous endoscopist not fully getting into the cecum and being able to have a good look there. So it's very important that that uh, point in the colon is attained and documented. Uh, if you have um, a uh, electronic system, uh, when you're doing these cases, I find it's important to uh, take a picture of the appendix to confirm that I was in the cecum, take a picture of the ileocecal valve, take pictures of other findings, and then on withdrawal, take pictures of retroflexion in the rectum. And here is the, uh, the base of the appendix. Um, on this case, just for illustrative purposes, um, this is the terminal ileum, which has a classic kind of uh, lymphoid uh, pr proliferation there, um, and the almost velvety appearance of the mucosa of the small in intestine, uh, again confirming that that is uh, intubation of the terminal ileum. On withdrawing the scope, um, typically people seem to spend more time getting to the cecum and then uh, pulling back on the scope. Actually, the withdrawal part is the most important part. That's the part where diagnoses are made, where it's important uh, to both withdraw and advance the scope again and make sure that each fold and the back of each fold as far as possible is evaluated so that lesions are not missed. Um, it's important not to evacuate air too early. Obviously, you don't want to leave the patient distended and uncomfortable, um, but um, as I go through each segment of the colon, um, I leave it uh, insufflated with air in order to better evaluate the mucosal surfaces. And then when I get to the end of that segment, uh, then aspirate some air from it uh, in order to relieve uh, uh, any distension of the colon and make the patient more comfortable at the end of the, the procedure. Uh, in the rectum, it's important to retroflex, as I mentioned. Obviously, a colonoscope is forward viewing. Uh, it cannot see lesions. Uh, in the very distal rectum very well. So it's very important to retrof retroflex so as not to miss a uh, very distal uh, rectal lesion. Here you see retroflexion uh, with some of the whitish changes on the epithelium there, su suggesting some metaplastic changes from prolapsing internal hemorrhoids. Um, I document this. I put a picture of this uh, in the colonoscopy report. I have uh, actually stopped commenting on whether or not patients have hemorrhoids because I was finding uh, many asymptomatic patients who had no problems with their hemorrhoids whatsoever 
being subsequently uh, referred to me by their primary physician after they saw the comment hemorrhoids on their colonoscopy. And here, just a, a demonstration of retroflexion. And this particular patient there, you can see at uh, 9 o'clock on the screen, has a, a classic uh, anal papilla. So in summary, I would um, say that uh, diagnostic colonoscopy has multiple guidelines out there for its appropriate uh, use. It's important to be uh, well-trained and qualified in doing this uh, in order to not miss lesions and be thorough with the inspection of the colon. Thank you for your attention.